<laughs> Jeff's right, our musical folks with musical ability here are just fantastic. It's been a great day with uh, each of the instruments. Thank you so very much. It adds to our service, and uh, God just truly blesses, blessing us with that. Today we're going to start the series on the seven churches. <clears throat> so let's start by saying welcome to Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write. So the, uh, Jesus is instructing the uh, angel who has gone to see John on the Isle of Patmos to write. He's going to give him instructions. What do you know about Ephesus? Let me give you some idea. First of all, Ephesus is the gateway to Asia. They had a beautiful man-made harbor that was about three miles that they had uh, dug away and developed inland. Now, today that sets over seven miles away. It's filled with silt. They had trouble keeping it clear. It was always a lot of work. But the city of Ephesus was very rich. It was capable of handling large ships. So from all over, it was the gateway into Asia. You could come into Ephesus and you could find Roman roads, which were the best. You could find Roman roads going to any part of the great continent. They would be easy, easily accessible to any place else. Ephesus had a distinction of being a free city. Now to us that doesn't sound so important, but in the day of Jesus, in the day of the apostles, that was really important. A free city means that there is no Roman occupation. No Roman troops are there. They're self-governing. They've got their own officials from their own community that are going to govern them. Now, why is that so important? Well, you can imagine what it would be like if you had a garrison of soldiers stationed here who are going to be harassing and always giving you trouble. Ephesus had none of those problems at all. It had a great view out to the harbor. It sat on the parts of two hills and you could look out into the uh, man-made harbor and all that was transpiring that was going on there. A great wealthy city. A lot of its wealth was derived from Diana. Diana or Artemis was the goddess of fertility. And a lot of the wealth was derived from the great goddess Diana and the temple that was there. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It ended up burning seven times. It was replaced seven times. It burned seven times or it was replaced six times. Um, they didn't replace it. They didn't put it back. But the last time was so great and magnificent that it become kind of the, the central bank of the world. They would bring artwork from other places that would be stored there for safety. The wealth of the temple was unbelievable. It was the treasure house of all of Asia and much of Roman world. But now there was a little problem with it. Anywhere on the outer skirts of the temple of Diana, anything within a bow shot, criminals could live there and not be prosecuted. So you had to go through criminal village in order to get to the temple. But that seemed to be not a lot of a problem during that day. Because they couldn't be arrested there and they would be safe there, so they caused little problem. The Temple of Diana uh, employed a great number of people including silversmiths. Remember the account of the silversmith Demetrius with the Apostle Paul on his mission journey and Demetrius <clears throat> that was the second missionary journey would rally the city against the Apostle because it was dipping into his livelihood. The Apostle Paul would be there three different times. The second missionary journey would be the first time that he would be there in Acts chapter 18. But he's only going to pass through. Now while he's there he's got a, Aquila and Priscilla with him and he will leave them there because the church seems to be flourishing. And he would tell them, well if it's God's will I'm going to be back. I'm coming back. And he would go back. While Aquila and Priscilla was there there was an evangelist by the name of Apollos that would come there and work. And it says that they taught him more fully the way of God. The third missionary journey would be Acts chapter 19. At that time the Apostle Paul will spend three years there and have a fantastic ministry. This is the most unlikely city for a church. It's very diversified. There's over 200,000 population. You know we don't think about ancient cities being that large. But over 200,000 population. There are six different Ethnic groups represented, tribal groups, 
there's not a lot of harmony there. But because it was a free city, they didn't do a lot of rebelling because that would have meant Rome would have put troops in there. So on the third missionary journey, the Apostle Paul would stay uh, three years. Now he will make one more trip back by there, and that's on his way to Jerusalem. And he doesn't get into Ephesus, but he will call for the elders in Acts chapter 20 to come out and pray with him because he is on his way to Jerusalem. We'll later find that the uh, uh, young Timothy was with Paul. You'd find that in the Acts 20, I believe. And later on, whenever Paul would write to Timothy, Paul is the minister at the church in Ephesus. Like I said, it's the most unusual spot to even think about having a church. It's such a town of the world and with the great goddess Diana, there's just not a whole lot of room there. Now there was another uh, segment of worship that would have been the worship of Rome's leader, Caesar. There would be a Caesar type of worship and temple there. But it was nothing compared to Diana. So Diana pretty well controlled the whole city. From the politics on, the, the priest of Diana would be in charge. But now the apostle John will be instructed while on prison island, Patmos, he'll be instructed to write to the church in Ephesus. And it's very revealing as we look at it. It's going to tell us that the church is doing some very good things. But let's start out by first of all, the, uh, Jesus will show his power. Christ shows his power. Revelation chapter 2 verse 1. It says, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars represent the seven angels from chapter 1. Now angel was a word for messenger, messenger. The seven candlesticks, the seven churches that they are writing to. He's going to show the power of the very presence of Christ that is going to be there. It's being displayed in verse 1. He says, I hold these churches. Now, if you were to study the Greek, it would say, I have a complete grasp. I have a hold of them. I am grasping on to them. He knows what's going on in the church. He's aware of it. Christ is with them always through the Holy Spirit, through his means. He's always with his people, just like he is now. He's always with us, knowing what is happening. So he knows what's happening in the churches. Now the messengers, many will believe that it's talking about the local preacher that is there. In this case, it may be Timothy. That the angel's representing the messenger that is there. He knows the church and he knows the preacher and he knows what is transpiring. He knows how it's unfolding. And he will tell us some positive things. So he starts out with the very positive. He starts out with praise, verse 3. In verse 3 it's going to say this, you have persevered, uh, let's see, let's go verse 2, uh, you know you, excuse me, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship in my name and have not grown weary. He starts out by praise. He said, I want to tell you some of the things the church is doing. The church has been good. It's been an active ministry in deeds, in hard work, in persevering. If you're doing your bulletin, those are the three. That hard work in deeds, work, and persevering. The Greek word says that um, knowledge, he says, I know. It's all knowing. It's full knowledge of what is transpiring. So what are they doing? Well, let's think about what Jesus had instructed the church to do. And we go back to Matthew. And Matthew, he would say, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you come to see me. You welcomed me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you come to see me. I believe the church in Ephesus is doing all these deeds. It's doing everything that you would think a church ought to be doing. That it's taking care of people in its vicinity. See, Christ is aware of the deeds of the church then. Now folks, get this. He's aware of the deeds today. He's aware of the things, the deeds that we are doing. 
We could identify various deeds that we are involved in and Christ is aware of them. He knows them. But yet that may not be sufficient, so we'll come back to that. They were deeds, things that they were involved in doing. The next thing he says, I know your works, your hard works. Things that are being done physically, toil is another good word for it, to the point of exhaustion, where we are working for Christ to the point of exhaustion. Now that can be in two or three means that he is addressing that. Maybe it's because they're out evangelizing. Maybe they're driving nails and helping neighbors. But it's to the point of exhaustion that the church has stayed totally involved. He said, I know your hard works. And then he said, I know that you have persevered. I know that you are seeing it through. I know that these things are, are not coming easily. I know that you've had patience and endurance, steadfastness, persistence. You're seeing things through. He said, and I praise you for all of these things. Now folks, let's stop and think just a moment about what's taking place. He said, all these things are very good and you're doing them. So what can he have against them? He even would say, you know, the Ephesian church is intolerant of evil. Whenever there's evil that's going on, you don't tolerate it. You know, we tolerate a lot of evil around us. There's often evil. But the church spoke up against it. If church speaks up today uh, against gay marriages, against abortion, oh, there's a lot of people that speak out against the church. So we can't speak up against things, so we think. The church in Ephesus was speaking up and saying this is what Jesus has said. This is what's taking place. He praises the Ephesian church for all the things that they've been doing. But he said, I got a problem. So Christ will state the problem. In verses four through six, he's going to state the problem. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lamp stand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolodian, Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Which I also hate. He said, wait a second, we got a problem. You have forsaken your first love. Folks, this is the meat of the letter. This is the part that we all need to hear and need to understand. Church can, can be involved in a lot of good deeds. We can do a lot of good things. I could mention good things that this church does in our community day after day, week after week, month after month, even year after year. How many years have we been handing out coats? And how many years have we been feeding a breakfast? And how many years have we been helping with school supplies? Folks, those are all wonderful, good things. As long as we're doing them in the name of Jesus. But if we're doing them for our own self-glory, then we're doing them all wrong. We have to do them in the name of Jesus. He said, remember from where you have fallen. I want all of you to take a little journey with me, if you would. I want all of you to go back early on in your Christianity. Some of us have been Christians a long, long time. Some of us have been at it most of our life. I started whenever I was 18. Most of us have been at it a long, long time. Have we forgotten the thrill of those first days when we come to Jesus? Have we forgotten what it was like? What were some of the first things you did? He said, remember where you've come from. Remember where you've fallen from. Would it be fair to say that whenever you first found Jesus, you may have been a little bolder. Now, you know why that was so? You knew more non-church people than you do now. And you were bold and saying, no, I go to church on Sunday. Most of you here today know more church people than you do non-church people. That's how our life changes. He said, remember to be bold with the message. What else did you do when you was early on in Christ? Most people 
identify the fact that they probably prayed more early on because they were excited about the fact that I can talk to God. I can bow my head and I can pray and God be with my family that they will accept. Most of us fall into that category. He said, remember from where you have fallen. He said, your deeds are great. You're doing such good things. But are you doing them for the right reason? Are we doing them for the right reason? Now, I believe that the things that we are doing here at Latonia, we're doing for the right reason. I have full confidence in that. But it, us as an individual, why are you doing that? I want all of you to go back to those early days of your Christianity. Remember how exciting it was to come into church? Wow. Really, I don't know for you, but it was exciting for me. Whenever I first become a Christian, it was all so brand new to me. I was excited to go to that first Christian church of Flor, Illinois, all summer long. I went to Bible college in the fall, and I went all summer long, and I was so excited, and those nice people would greet me. I was a teenager by myself, and they'd greet me, and oh, I felt like a million dollars. How important it was. Have we made Christianity boring because we've forgotten from where we've come? Have we missed out on the great joys of giving our money to school supplies? Because we know from whence we've come. Whenever I think about how the church has blessed so many lives, but we can miss that blessing if we are doing it for the wrong reason. Our deeds can be great. You can work to exhaustion you can persevere and be here every Sunday. But if Christ is not first in your heart, repent. That's what he says in this letter. Turn around. Remember from where you have fallen. Because when you come in, you were at the top. Every one of us in our conversion can look back and say, what good days. I can remember Deb and I being so young and going to so many different churches and we would go to revivals. When's the last time you ever heard of a church having a revival today? From whence we have come. Or there would be a big singing and we'd go, and she drug me to Southern Gospel after Southern Gospel. There wasn't a single beach boy there. And we would go to school auditoriums. I had made myself a promise that when I got out of high school I would never return. And we would go to school auditoriums and we would listen to these Southern Gospel groups. I can remember how exciting it was when Mikey was little. We would load up the church van with clothing and head off to Cooks and Hills. Me and a five or six year old little boy. He stayed in more children's homes than most kids did unless they lived there. Because we would go and how exciting it was when you drive up and you see the thrill on their face. That you've just arrived with supplies. Remember from where you have fallen. Many a times a church identifies with the good things that they are doing. If we have created that here, here's my word of advice. Stop it. We associate our good things with Jesus. It's Jesus who keeps this church healthy and strong. It is Jesus who holds us firmly in his grasp. It is Jesus who has told us, remember how it started. It is Jesus that said return to the things that you did at first. Pray and praise. Even though your deeds, your works, your perseverance are commendable, 
He said, your love has slipped. Repent. Do your good deeds in his name. In his name. So as we come today, what can we gain from the Ephesian letter? Well, good deeds are really nice. Hard work is even better. Persevering is good. But without love, they are nothing. Without love, they are nothing. The greatest of these is love. That we must love the ones that we're reaching out to. That we must love the community that we're ministering to. See, I believe the Ephesian church had got started off in such a grand way. They had such great preachers. They had Aquila and Priscilla there helping establish the church. They had young Apollos who was a great evangelist. They had the Apostle Paul who had dropped by, spent three years. They have young Timothy. Timothy had a Greek father and a Jewish mother. All of a sudden the church has got a message that, hey, there's conversions that are capable. And the church is doing well. But somewhere towards the end of the first century, Jesus saw the need to send them word. I want you to look around in our society today. Would anyone besides me think that maybe Jesus has been sending word to churches throughout our land? I'm concerned. I'm concerned that sometimes we're so wrapped up in the glory of it or the size of it or how big and magnificent the event can be that we forget just the good old fashioned church service where we just assemble in the name of Jesus. We didn't assemble here in the name of greatness, folks. We assembled here in the name of Jesus. If you've come for greatness, he's preaching somewhere else today. We've come for Jesus. And if we don't lose sight of that, there's something that is in store for us. He has secured a promise. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7 will simply say this. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. To him who overcomes, overcomes, they can eat from the tree of life. So what do we have to overcome? Our deeds, our works, our perseverance is good. So what do we have to overcome? We have to overcome ourselves, folks. That this isn't about us. This is about Him. Our worship to service today isn't about us. It's about Him. Our instruments, all who played instruments did so great and enjoyed it so much. But I hope you heard the message that they were playing. I appreciated the do, Lord. It's been a long time since I heard that. I was whistling. I hope I didn't interrupt you. But, yeah. It was about Him. Whenever Ed left, leads us in communion, it's not about Ed, it's about him. Whenever Marshall had the offering meditation, it wasn't about Marshall, it's about him. Whenever we have the sermon, it's not about me, it's about him. When we meet around this table, it's not about us as a, a community, it's about him and his sacrifice. He said, if you overcome, you can eat from the tree of life. So what does that mean? The tree of life is heaven. You can come and be with him forever and forever and never die. That works for me. That works for me. And never die. Oh, I'm going to set this aside, but I will live forever. I plan to eat from the tree of life. How about you? We're going to have our hymn of decision. Ephesus was a tough old town. Some say it was maybe as big as 250,000. Others said 200, 225. And there was a church reaching out, small but powerful. He said, but remember where you come from. Will you all please stand as we have our invitation.
Good morning, everybody. I'm going to read a series of questions just like last week, um, and I'll tell you to say whether we do well or whatever. Um, do you, members of Latonia Christian Church and faithful believers in Christ Jesus, choose for these men who stand before you set apart for this task? If you do, answer, we do. Um, will you commit yourselves to pray for them in the work of Christ as servants? We will. Are you willing to honor and encourage them in all things considered with the will of God? We are. Will you aid them and actively help them in the discharge of their responsibilities and duties? We will. I chose to do the questioning of the wives because half of my life, Fran has been telling me what to do and what her expectations are. So I thought I would take this opportunity to do the same. And it's a great honor because these two folks uh, before us today have been a huge, huge influence on my life. And uh, they're much older than I am. And uh, so I wanted to say, say that. Uh, I'll pay for that. Fran, if you would. Have you, prayerfully and cons and have you prayerfully and carefully considered the responsibility of the servant's role that your husband is entering into and the responsibility that you will have as his wife? So say I have. Will you pray for and encourage your husband in the responsibilities that will be his and seek God's strength through scripture and prayer? Are you willing to keep God in, his, in first priority and to provide a good witness and encouragement as a servant's wife? Are you willing to share your husband with this spiritual task and still have him serve God, your Lord Jesus Christ, in the ministry of Latonia Christian Church? But have you prayerfully and carefully considered the responsibility of the servant's role that you are being set apart for? Will you, through scripture and prayer, seek God's will for your life and for the strength to fulfill the task for which you are set apart? Are you willing to keep the priorities of God, God's will first in your life and to provide a good witness and encouragement to those you serve and are in contact with? Do you enter into the spiritual task and responsibility relying on God for your strength and direction? Do you still desire to serve God, your Lord Jesus Christ, in the ministry of Latonia Christian Church in this capacity? Once again, any who have been ordained who would like to take part in the ordination service, please come up and we'll have the laying on of hands setting them aside for this task that they have agreed to. Several years ago, many years ago, uh, Fran come and told me, she said, Bud would probably come if someone would come to see him. I was there that afternoon. So, uh, and he's been very faithful ever since and I've been very blessed by that. They've been a great uh, encouragement to many of us. Thank you. 
Lord, we thank you for the decision made this day and for that is accepted this deaconship. We thank you for your willingness to come to this church, your church, Lord, and work. And we just pray that you friend, that you will bless her, Lord, as she, being a backbone, a bud, knowing, Lord, that it takes both to see things through, to make things happen, Lord, as husband and wife. Both are in harmony with you and the Father. We just ask your blessing upon each one of them and their family, Lord, to continue walking with them this day and for the days that come forth. For these things, Lord, we do pray for Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, this is for the walk, so everyone be still for a minute. We'll get a